Hi my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my July books video for you, which I'm very excited about. I'm not quite as on time as I was last month, but we're still doing okay. It's the 13th today, so we're doing okay. I had some notes that I need to get up. Um, I can already tell today that my brain is not in it. Um, but I really wanted to film today so I can get this video up for you guys. And I'm going to do my best to be articulate and know what I'm saying, but you never know. I feel like I'm a little bit all over the place today. So as usual, before we get started on the video, I am going to tell you guys what the book club picks are for next month. So like I've been doing recently, I've got a couple books. So the first one is Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. I've been meaning to read this for a long, long, long time. Um, it is a sort of personal narrative, history, reportage, mixture. So yes, it's non-fiction and yeah, it's mostly about race in America. So I'm not entirely sure what to expect. It's not a book of essays, um, particularly I think it's kind of like a, just one of those kind of mishmash non-fiction books with various different genres. It comes highly recommended. So that is the first book club pick. And the second book club pick is Redhead by the Side of the Road, completely different. This is by Anne Tyler. I've never read any Anne Tyler before. I know she's a prolific author and I know she is beloved by many. Um, so I'm excited to read this, which is her latest book, which has just been nominated for the Booker Prize. Um, so if you did want to join me in reading some of the book along listers, then you could maybe read this one with me this month. Or if you just love Anne Tyler and you want to read her latest release with me. It's about a man named Micah who kind of has a very regimented life. He has his routines, he thinks he's kind of contented and happy. And then a couple of things come into his life which sort of change it and cause a bit of an upheaval. Um, one of which is his woman friend, as he calls her, his girlfriend, tells him she's facing eviction because of a cat, um, presumably meaning she wants to kind of move in with him, and also a teenager turns up at his door claiming to be his son. Very intrigued by this one, and this is next month's second book club pick. Um, so let me know how you get on with those, let me know if you've read both, one of them. Right, on to... Um, July's book club picks. Let me sort myself out here. We're all in the wrong order. So this is one of the books I picked. This is Jacqueline Woodson's Red at the Bone. So this one is about an affluent black family living in Brooklyn. Um, and as the novel opens, we meet Melody, who is turning 16, or she is 16, and she's kind of being presented in a kind of cotillion type event, um, sort of coming of age event basically and the reader discovers that Melody was actually the result of a teenage pregnancy which kind of drastically altered her mum's life um, and caused a bit of resentment there, um, a bit of miscommunication, just a bit of tension between Melody and her mother primarily. So yes this is a slim little book um, but over the course of it, we hear from five characters, five characters' perspectives, over three generations. And we're sort of looking at the inheritance of trauma, not just in that fraught kind of mother and daughter relationship, but also um, before that, obviously, they're in Brooklyn um, throughout most of the novel. But the maternal family hails from Tulsa and... Um, some of that trauma is inherited through the female line from the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. But yes, if you don't know about that at all, then I would highly recommend you go and Google it because it is very shocking and um, an important event in black American history. This novel is also not just looking at race, um, not just looking at the inheritance of trauma through that family line. It's also looking at class because Melody's mother comes from an affluent background but Melody's father doesn't or didn't um, when they find out about the teen pregnancy. So it's looking at those differences in class, how that might interact with um, race as well and how this has an effect not just on the relationship between Melody's parents but also through the other characters in the novel as well. Um, so at first I was worried I was not going to like this book um, because although the prose is very beautiful, definitely Woodson is extremely talented on that 
side of things. I felt myself just wanting more from it. I don't know if you guys can see, but it's a short book and it's kind of fragmentary like this. So I just thought when I started it, you know, this is going to be one where the prose is going to be beautiful, but it's not going to draw me in quite so much because I'm going to want more time with the characters, I'm going to want more depth, I'm going to want more nuanced exploration of some of these ideas. Um, but as I got into the flow of it a little bit more, I found it quite useful, and I don't know if this is a bit of a weird thing, but I found it quite useful to think of it almost like as a prose poem. Um, now, that might sound a bit weird if you guys have read this, it definitely is a novel, but it helped me to think of it in a way where I could appreciate it for what it was and not for what it wasn't. So yes, although I don't think I'll be like thinking about this book for many, many years to come, um, I do really think it's quite beautiful, it's very lyrical, um, and I think if it sounds of interest to you, it's definitely worth a read. So on the other side this month, I also picked Women Racing Class for our book club, for our kind of non-fiction side of things. This is by Angela Davis. If you guys don't know who Angela Davis is, um, she's a black American activist, author, social theorist, um, academic, all of those good things. And she often covers the way that gender, race and class interact, as you might suspect from the title of this book. Um, yes, yeah, because she's coming from a kind of Marxist, anti-capitalist standpoint. Um, she's one of those big names that was writing in the 70s, um, 70s onwards, about this stuff, and she's been massively influential. Um, I thought I actually hadn't read any Angela Davis, but then I realised about halfway through, I was like, I kind of know where this is going, and I think I must have read the final essay at uni, and I had. <laughs> um, and it actually is my favourite essay of the whole book as well. Um, so I'm glad my education didn't make a complete omission of Angela Davis's work, um, but I definitely do want to read more. So as the title would suggest, Davis is looking at the interactions between um, gender, race and class in the US all the way from slavery, um, it kind of goes chronologically, all the way from slavery through to the late 70s, early 80s when this, what, this book was released. So there's lots and lots and lots of history in here. One of the things she kind of repeatedly shows is how black women were excluded from a lot of social movements or mainstream social movements. For example, the abolitionist movement, mainstream feminism, or even anti-capitalist or workers movements as well. So on the one hand, those um, movements really failed to address the unique needs of black women, but also on the other hand it really weakened those movements because, because they failed to be fully inclusive, they often ignored how some issues affect people from all different spheres, lots of different instantiations of all sort of different, le different levels of inclusion. Um, so it's not just black women that would be excluded from particular movements, it would be from the um, mainstream feminist movement, um, working class women were often also excluded, so there's all sorts of different kind of levels basically and different exclusions and inclusions in these social movements which really weakens them and obviously Davis is making the point that you kind of need to unite all of them to make a difference. So things I really liked about this book, I really liked um, that I learnt a little bit of backstory behind some of the kind of famous names of famous black activists that I had heard of before but I didn't know the kind of context in which they were working, in which they were writing. Um, so I liked that I could read one book and kind of get a really good idea of um, a lot of that history. Particularly, obviously, um, it was interesting to read about a lot of the black female activists um, who contributed so much to social justice movements. Um, so much to radical politics and I feel like for such a kind of it's not a, it's not a huge book it felt very comprehensive it felt very wide-ranging and I think if you were to read it you definitely have areas where you think I want to research a little bit more into that the last essay is my favorite because well partially because it's the most contemporary obviously it's the most relevant today to today but also because I think um, Davis really gets into a theorizing stride in this final essay. In that essay she's looking at how radical feminist movements of the 70s, um, including the kind of wages for housework movement, once again excluded or failed to address the needs of black women um, and the kind of problems of white feminism in that respect. Um, so yes, there. Are, I mean there are plenty of more 
contemporary books you could read on these subjects. Um, but it's good to know that a lot of the work that's being done now is heavily influenced by Davis's work. So I appreciated reading her work in that sense because it's good to know where a lot of the ideas that we kind of take for granted now have come from. And it's also a good overview of the history um, for some of this information, some of those ways that gender, race and class have been working over the last few hundred years in the US. Um, so yes, I definitely would recommend this one. I hope if you guys read it that you also found it useful and educational. So next we have Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergei Djachenko. Djachenko? Um, so yes, this is written by a couple. It's written by a Ukrainian couple and it's translated from the Russian by Julia Maitov Hersey. Um, so I listened to this book and I was so <laughs> relieved to have finally found a book that I really enjoyed listening to. Um, I found that most of my kind of audio books have caveats to them, either the book itself is crap or the narration is bad or I would have enjoyed them more if I'd actually read them rather than listened to them. So I was very pleased to have enjoyed listening to this one, although I do also want to reread it I think physically in the future just to get some of those things that I might have kind of skipped over a little bit when I was listening. So this is a kind of philosophical fantasy, which typically is kind of right up my street. Um, it follows Sasha, I think she's kind of around 17. She's gonna go off to uni soon, she's gonna do her final exam to go off to uni. Um, and in her final summer with her mum, they go on holiday to the seaside and she keeps seeing this kind of strange figure and he's kind of watching her and he begins trying to communicate with her and she just is creeped out by him obviously as she would be I think and she tries to avoid him but she finds she can't avoid him and eventually when she gives in and he communicates with her he says that he wants her to do this strange task which is to go to the beach at like 4 or 5 a.m every single morning and go for a swim and when she comes out of the sea after going for these um, early morning swims, she throws up um, gold coins, which is obviously quite weird. And it's very strange and very surreal. Um, and this meeting essentially turns her life upside down. So Farrakh Kozhenikov continues to sort of badger her, even when she's back in normal life. And she ends up going to this kind of completely unknown university in the middle of nowhere, um, studying some inexplicable subject that she can barely understand. So what I love about this book is that even though it's got that kind of magical school trope going on, which we see in lots of fantasy, um, it completely overturns all your expectations um, to create something that's really unique, that's very clever. And I think that's actually really hard to do in fantasy these days. I was completely surprised. I wasn't expecting um, the kind of reveal, I guess, at all, which I really appreciated. Um, but because of that, I can't really tell you guys too much more about this book because I don't want to spoil that for you. Yeah, people have described it as a kind of Kafka-esque magical school trope fantasy because it's definitely got that kind of nightmarish atmosphere where Sasha feels trapped in these things that she just doesn't understand. Um, so the pro style kind of keeps you at a remove from Sasha and I think that's kind of a cultural pro style difference um, but also I think it serves to kind of preserve that uncanny, eerie feeling um, that the novel has, but I suspect it will annoy some readers, um, even though I came to care for Sasha myself anyway. Um, also, it kind of moves slowly, I don't know, but can you see how tiny this writing is? When I got this book, obviously I listened to it, but when I got this book I thought this writing was absolutely tiny, so it is quite long. Um, it does move sort of slowly, but I, it might not be quite as slow if you actually were to read it as opposed to listen to it, but it's got a sort of nightmarish pace um, and it kind of builds and builds and builds to its reveals. So I think the pacing works well personally, but again, I don't think it would work for everyone. If it does sound like your kind of thing though, I would definitely recommend it. But there are actually um, sequels to this book, but they haven't been published in translation. Um, which is so sad. Please, who publishes this? Harper Voyager. Please can you publish the rest of these books? I don't know where it will go next and I'm very intrigued. So yes, someone please. I think they've been translated. I read on a Reddit thread or something that they had been translated but they haven't been published. 
or something like that. So someone needs to publish those for me, please. Okay, next we have Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel. You guys know I loved Wolf Hall. I actually had been putting off reading this book because I loved Wolf Hall so much. I wanted to eke out the joy of reading these books. And also I feel like because they're quite intense, if you did read them all at once, maybe you would like them less. Although I love them so much, I don't think that would be the case. But um, yeah, Zach thinks that's a very weird way of reading series. But if I really enjoy a series, I sort of spread it out a little bit. But yeah. Now that the mirror and the light is officially out, it's been nominated for the booker again, I thought it was high time that I started this one. Plus I picked it up to read over my birthday, it's my birthday book because I sort of knew I was going to love it so I was like this is a good bet, good bet for a birthday book. Um, if you see me doing this by the way I am, I am using my notes, if you see me looking here I'm using my notes. I have started to be to write more copious notes for these videos so that I don't end up rambling too much. I don't know if it's working, but yes, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my notes. Zach just delivered me tea, which I think I really need. <laughs> this was just as fantastic as I expected. Um, and just like with Wolfall, there's something absolutely magical about Mantel's prose. She really plunges you into Tudor England I just want to live in her book, even though it sounds like it would be kind of ruthless and scary. Um, I just love it. If you're a history buff but you don't read a lot of novels, I do think her prose style is a little bit challenging, but if you kind of get into the rhythm of it and you're a history buff, you will love these. You'll love them. I will leave my review of Wolf Hall down below, uh, my written review. Although if you want to go back and watch the video you can, that was in February. Yeah, I don't want to repeat myself too much about the style of Mantel's prose in these books and her, kind of her writing. Um, but yeah, so in this book we see Cromwell dealing with the newly crowned Anne Boleyn and with the lack of the male heir and everyone's feeling a bit testy and Cromwell has all these new powerful titles and he has a kind of more official position in the court now. Um, the relationship between him and Anne Boleyn begins to sour and this lack of male heir is also leading to a lot of, a lot of tension and so and because of that Cromwell finds himself once again dealing with Henry's wandering eye um, and having to maybe make new arrangements again. So I found Cromwell to be a bit more ruthless in this novel. Um, it's certainly there in the first one, but it just feels a bit more overt in this one. I think possibly because of he's got he's got this new status, he's got this new power. So yeah, I'm interested to see how that develops into the final book, whether he changes again, whether he becomes even more ruthless, and kind of what leads sorry, <laughs> what leads to his downfall. I hope I'm not spoiling anything there because <laughs> these events have been in the history books for a few hundred years. Yes, I have heard that the final book is a little bit over long and lacks some of the tension that you get in these first two books. I'm hoping that I don't think that's the case and that I just enjoy the mirror and the light because I just love them so much. They've really been a highlight of my reading year. Now we are on to The Vanishing Half which I know I let you guys know I would be reading this month as well um, if you wanted to read it with me. So yes, this is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. I have to say the American cover is a thousand times nicer than this one. I really dislike this cover. I think it's the colour combination. It is not my favourite. I wish I had the US version. Um, but yes, anyway, this is a much loved recent release. This has been everywhere. I'm sure you guys have seen it if you're kind of into looking at new releases and stuff. I'm sure you guys have seen it everywhere. Maybe lots of you have read it as well. Um, and probably you've heard the blurb before, but I will just reiterate. Um, so it's about twins. They're two girls that live in a fictional town in Louisiana called Mallard, which is populated pretty much exclusively by light-skinned black people. Um, and having tragically witnessed the lynching of their father, um, the two girls try to kind of escape their past, escape their trauma, and they leave for New Orleans, and they begin to drift apart, and eventually one decides to officially start kind of passing for white. She gets a new 
fiance a new partner who doesn't know that she's not white um, and she makes her life for herself that way whilst the other eventually ends up returning to Mallard with her dark skinned child because she's escaping an abusive husband uh, and this kind of all takes place over 60s, 70s and 80s I think. So naturally this book is looking at racism um, but it's also looking at colorism if you guys don't know that means the kind of differences between how light and dark skinned black people are treated um, with dark skinned people tending to be treated worse both within and without um, the black community. So yes it's looking at colorism, um, it's also looking at the internal dynamics of what it might mean to pass for white um, how that feels for Stella, who is the character, the, the twin that um, does go and kind of live as a white woman. And obviously that's also touching on lots of ideas about privilege in colorism, in racism. Um, it also looks at families and our relationships to one another and what we owe to each other and kind of twin dynamics as well. If you guys are a twin, you might enjoy this one because it's sort of looking at, at all of those those dynamics. Um, so I thought there was lots to like about this book. But my general takeaway from this novel is that I wish there had been more. Um, unlike with Red at the Bone, which I could kind of see as a prose poem because it is, show it is so short, this one is definitely a novel. And so I just wanted there to be more to it. Um, whilst I thought the prose was really beautiful, it was often reminiscent of Toni Morrison with its lyricism and some of those like, like uncanny, strange elements. Um, it felt like it was sort of meandering basically, it didn't have much drive and I wanted more of the in-between scenes, I wanted more of the little moments um, and I could I think easily have read like a 600 page version of this book. And I do find this with a fair amount of literary fiction. I feel like I need to come up with a term for it because I just feel like a lot of literary fiction does have really beautiful prose but it just lacks like drive or purpose sometimes. I think it's sometimes like an author knows they want to go from A to B and they kind of do a little bit of a kind of formulaic way of getting there. Or they kind of just insert scenes but they don't really the scenes don't feel like they have a really good enough like why, like why are you there sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. That doesn't mean there needs to be loads more like plot or plotting, but there just seem, needs to be like really good reasons why scenes are in there. Um, I don't really know how to explain it and I hope one day I'll put my finger on it, like how you get from a novel that seems to me to be meandering a little bit to a novel that does seem to have a lot of kind of literary drive um, but it's the latter that really makes a book stick in my mind I think and makes me want to reread it. Possibly it's something to do with pacing, possibly it is something to do with sensing that the author doesn't have a good really really good reason for certain bits to be in there, I don't know. But How Much of These Hills is Gold is another kind of example of one of my recent reads where I felt that it just sort of lacked a little bit of that, a little bit of that drive. But there's lots, like I said, there's lots to like about this book. The prose is beautiful. Um, I think obviously it's an important book and it really speaks to a lot of people. So I don't want to take away from that. I mean, if you enjoyed this, ignore me completely. I do think it has important conversations about colorism. I don't think I've ever read um, a novel that's quite so focused on colorism specifically. I know that um, Passing by Nella Larson is a good example, which I haven't read, which is on my list to read. Um, of another novel that's about kind of passing for white and colorism in general. So yes, all of those things strike me as very important, but yeah, just something about the machinations of this book. I thought there was more potential here, um, just potential for more. But yes, so if it sounds of interest to you, I would definitely recommend it. Um, it's also kind of become quite iconic and a sort of touchstone of our times. So it's worth reading for that reason too, I think, if that sort of thing is important to you. Um, and it is to me, I like to be in tune with everyone else. I like to keep my finger on the pulse with books that people love, you know. So yes, that is that one. Okay, next we have Till by Daniel Kelman, who is a German author and this was translated by Ross Benjamin into the English. So this is another book which I thought had lots to love about it, but again, just sort of lost its way for me. 
um, and therefore my interest in it kind of came and went um, as I was reading. I'm so into my historical fiction at the moment, mostly because of Mantel. I think if historical fiction is done well, it can transport you just like the best of speculative fiction can transport you and you can also learn a lot from it, which I love. I've learned a lot about the Tudors from Mantel. I learned a lot about 15th century Florence from Joe Walton's Lent. So I'm just loving historical fiction. So it's about Till Uhlenspiegel, who is an already established trickster figure in German folklore. And in this book, Kelman places him in the Thirty Years' War, which I think is worth knowing a little bit about before you go into this book. I did a little bit of Googling and I think it was helpful. Um, but it was initially a sort of religious war between Catholics and Protestants in Central Europe between 1618 and 1648, but it ended up being a sort of general European war with lots of people kind of trying to get power, basically. Um, so this novel sort of bounces around the war and sometimes we're with Till, but more often we sort of glimpse him through another protagonist's eyes as he becomes part of their story, which I suppose is an interesting tricksterish sort of take on the picaresque or the episodic novel, um, because he kind of just pops in and out of sight. Um, I particularly enjoyed the sections given over to Elizabeth Stewart because I didn't know much about her and Kelman has definitely sparked an interest in me in her life and her history. Um, and I think what he's doing here with Till is to show the kind of resilience of human beings um, and Till can be really cruel on the one hand but he also makes light of anything, literally anything, even if it's the worst thing in the world. He's kind of like horrifying and funny and lovable at once. And I think for a war novel, that totally makes sense um, and is a good way to kind of satirise war. So, there are some brilliant sections in here. The first chapter I loved. I thought it was heart-wrenching, I thought it was funny, I thought it was horrifying, all at once, um, which is sort of the vibe of the best parts of the book. I honestly think it would really work well, that first chapter, as like a standalone story. I just loved it, I thought it was so impactful, I was like, yes, I'm gonna love this book. And yeah, like I said, I also really enjoyed the Elizabeth Stewart sections, but there are parts where it just falters. There are parts where you just want more till. Um, and it does end up feeling a bit disjointed and just like it's kind of going nowhere. It jumps around in time and you can sort of put a timeline together at the end of the book when you think about it, but it just feels melded together out of some rather random elements. Um, so whilst I liked this book, Again, it's one of those, I think, if it sounds like something you're interested in, then I'd recommend it, but it didn't quite live up to its potential for me. So next we have The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colour Blindness by Michelle Alexander. Um, this was a damning and deeply disturbing look at the criminal justice system in the US, particularly, obviously, mass incarceration and how it disproportionately affects the black community. Um, and she basically, in this, convincingly argues that mass incarceration is a new form of socioeconomic control over um, the black American population in the kind of same bent as um, slavery and as Jim Crow, even though it's sort of presented as an impartial system. That's kind of what makes it so successful. Um, and she explains um, how the war on drugs and Richard Nixon essentially designed the entire system of mass incarceration and allowed mass incarceration to happen um, in sort of in response to the civil rights movement um, and like I said in order to control um, the black American population so um, she shows how there were much lower incarcerations before the war on drugs and how after the war on drugs it really disproportionately affects black people. So this book was originally published 10 years ago and I can see how it's influenced lots of writing and theorising that has followed it. She was obviously drawing on things that had already been said before but I think she is really like the face of this idea um, that mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow and I felt familiar with her work even though obviously I hadn't read this before because it has been so influential. So if you are interested in how um, that came to be. If you're about to <laughs> argue with me that the system is not designed to control um, the black population in the US, then I would highly recommend you read this book first before you argue with me. 
It is extremely thorough, it has a wealth of information. I learned lots of historical details that I had no idea about. Um, and also my 10 year anniversary edition has an introduction on it in which um, Alexander looks at the legacy of her own work, in which she looks at the movement between the Obama and the Trump administration, um, kind of looks at how things have changed and addresses some concerns that original readers had, including what she might have missed, um, particularly I think people had a problem with her focus on black men rather than black women. I thought the introduction was obviously probably the most interesting bit for me because and she sort of summarises a lot of what she says in the rest of the book and adds a lot of relevant detail to now. So I would definitely recommend getting the 10th anniversary edition if you can. Um, but yes, I think this is an extremely important read. And if you're looking to learn more about how race functions in the US, I think it's an essential one because I think this is such a huge part of how it functions. Um, so yes, I highly recommend this one. So next up we have Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga, I think it's Tokarzuk or Tokarzuk, um, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I actually poured water all over this book so it's looking a little misshapen. So as you may know I really didn't get on with um, Tokarzuk's flights, um, I didn't like it at all, I didn't even finish it. Um, but that book was also beloved by the kind of, <laughs> by the literary reviewer gods, um, as this one is as well. Oh, this is translated from the Polish by Antonia Lloyd-Jones, by the way. So yes, I was a little bit apprehensive about starting this one, but everyone assured me it was quite different to Flights, and I'm pleased to report that I did enjoy this book much more than Flights, and I even finished it. So this is a kind of noirish novel about a woman, an elderly woman, living in rural Poland in a little village, um, and she has this urge to kind of protect the environment, protect the surrounding wildlife, and she is particularly derisive of this group of hunters um, and poachers who she basically just thinks are a disgrace to society. Um, and slowly around her these people begin to turn up dead and Janina begins to investigate and so this novel certainly has murder mystery tropes kind of in mind and that it is playing with those. Um, so I thought this novel started off strong, it had a real sense of atmosphere, it was very atmospheric and I appreciated various things about it including the environmental aspects as well as appreciating that it is a novel with an older woman as a protagonist which is actually quite rare and she is very much aware of the stereotypes of the crazy old lady and she uses them to her, to her advantage and turns them around on people um, that kind of pity or underestimate her which I appreciate as well. But the middle section of the book is kind of disappointing. I felt like it was just sort of floundering a little bit again and it has a little bit of flights and shallow philosophising where it kind of makes these profound statements that really wouldn't hold up to a bit of prodding. And also some of these sentiments are like repeated over and over again. I mean maybe this is a nod to old age in Janina's um, narration but I found it kind of annoying and a bit lazy. People call it an existential thriller that offers thought-provoking ideas and our perceptions of madness, injustice against marginalised people, animal rights, the hypocrisy of traditional religion, belief in predestination, and it caused a, gen a genuine political uproar in Poland. So, so it certainly has a lot of context, this book, I think, but for me, just coming to it as a reader, it didn't, it just, yeah, it didn't quite live up to its potential. Um, and I think it's safe to say, now I've tried this, now I've tried flights, I don't need to read any more of her writing. I think I can just say, do you know what, maybe she is not for me and if you love her writing, please do not let me change your mind. <laughs> um, I just think she's just not for me, it's just not my vibe. So next we have volume two of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, which is called In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower. Right, I don't want anyone to shout at me, but I think that this instalment of In Search of Lost Time lacks some of the things that make the first volume great and has a lot of the things that makes Proust sometimes tedious. Um, that doesn't mean I won't be reading the rest of the volumes, um, nor that there weren't things to admire in this book. And I'll link up my review to um, The Way by Swans down below if you want to have a look at my comments on Proust's 
prose style or what he is kind of attempting to achieve in these books. But yes, this one I didn't enjoy anywhere near so much and makes me nervous <laughs> for the next for the next ones. Um, so first of all, I think part of the problem is that this novel covers the narrator's adolescence, um, which I hope is over now as we move into volume three, uh, which I haven't started yet. And if there is one perspective in life, I just don't think I need to read a lot of. It's of a teenage boy pursuing girls, particularly a teenage boy from the late 19th century um, ar French aristocracy pursuing girls. It's just not a perspective that I feel like I need to read a lot of in life. Um, and that is the focus, basically, of this much lengthier volume, um, as you may be able to tell from the title, In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower. So the narrator first obsesses over Swan's daughter, Gilbert, and then over a whole group of girls in his summer holiday in Bolbeck. Um, so yes, in general I'm unsurprised that I didn't like this novel as much as I like the first one, which is a nice kind of nostalgic look at childhood. Because the focus is all on the girls, it doesn't have the sort of analysis and depiction of more interesting and strange characters or friends of the family that the first book does. It also, because it's the second volume, I think you're less surprised and delighted by some of um, Proust's prose and writing techniques and the way he kind of has this sort of dreamy yet exacting um, look at memory. Nor were there moments of like involuntary memory where he like eats something or um, is falling asleep and he has all these sensations and memories of a place and a time. Um, there's not a lot of that going on, there's not a lot of involuntary moments, memory moments in this. So it doesn't have all those things which I really liked about the first one, but it does have a lot of words about girls. Um, so yes, I did find it quite tedious. And there were also moments where I kind of remarked to myself that his observations, the narrator's observations, Proust's observations just seemed like wrong. And I think a lot of Proust relies on you going like, yes, that's exactly how my mind works. Oh my goodness, how could you write that down? But if you don't agree, um, then the prose quickly feels kind of self-indulgent and pretentious. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's not like impressive, like it is impressive, but it's also really tedious. <laughs> so yes, I'm interested to see how we get on with the next few volumes. I'm a bit scared. So next we have The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. This is another book which I kind of started off really enjoying and then quickly kind of became disappointed by. Um, it's beloved, so if you like this, please just skip my review. I don't want to ruin it for you. Um, but this is a fantasy novel. It's based partly on the Second Sino-Japanese War, which is kind of um, just before or around the time of the Second World War, if you guys didn't know. And according to a bit of online research, i.e. Wikipedia, um, the atmosphere and setting of this novel is more inspired by the Song Dynasty. Um, rather than the 20th century in which the Second Sino-Japanese War was. So, Kuang is a Chinese-American author and I really appreciated her bringing this history to fantasy audiences like myself who know very little about the Sino-Japanese War. And I read a good review on Goodreads which points out some of the historical background, some of the Chinese cultural references, um, so I'll link that down below for you if you guys want to go and see. I don't know if I had been more familiar with some of these aspects, I might have enjoyed the novel more. Um, but as it was, I just couldn't quite get on with it. So, the novel follows Rin, who is a dark-skinned war orphan, who manages to escape her cruel foster family and attend an elite military academy. And once she's there, she kind of obviously finds herself out of place amongst her rich upper-class students who have all been training um, for this academy for their whole lives and she must fight to be taken seriously and to keep her place um, and as you might expect of a fantasy novel it turns out that she has some kind of secret powers um, in some mysterious arts but after this first kind of school section she's plunged into a new war a new conflict and she serves on the front lines um, and she must decide whether to use her immense power to save her country from the Muganese, um, which is the equivalent of the Japanese, um, even if it might cost the lives of innocents. Um, I very much enjoyed 
the first section of the book. It was good, solid fantasy writing with nice world building. I particularly like when she described um, like places and the look of a place. Uh, I thought she did a really good job with that. Um, and it reminded me in lots of ways of The Name of the Wind. You've got this out of place kind of orphan student who is poor compared to a lot of other richer students. Um, and she's kind of facing the taunting of her fellows. We've got this kooky professor who seems to have this particular special power or art that he is going to single the protagonist out for to teach. And I really wanted this book to be like a female oriented alternate series that would have all the action that Rothfuss's novel didn't. Um, however, <laughs> unfortunately I think it goes the opposite way. It launches itself into action that it's just not ready for the, and the magic system seems to kind of disintegrate or at least not kind of complexify pro properly um, as Rin applies it to the real world. And this is my fault but I'm just not sure I actually like military plot lines in general. Like I'm happy to read historical novels about war but fantasy, um, speculative fiction, war novels are not my kind of thing. The only exception I can think to that is Sishin Liu's, um, oh my god, what's it called? Three Body Problem series, which is kind of about, is a kind of military speculative fiction, but it is high, it's quite unusual as well. Um, but yeah, so this novel kind of solidified that for me. I'm going to be more wary of those sorts of things in the future. And I can't quite describe why, um, but the prose felt very young adult to me. Um, making the excessive violence and gore kind of stand out a bit oddly. Maybe it was the dialogue, maybe it was the protagonist character development. Lots of people have problems with Rin being a sort of one of those characters where you're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> that decision makes no sense. Um, it personally didn't bug me that much because I had other problems with the book, but it might be something to do with that because that's a very kind of young adult thing. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but it just kind of had a flavour of young adult um, and I, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it to young adults because it has got heavy themes, disturbing scenes. As I've gotten older I just don't particularly appreciate the um, young adult um, fantasy style, it just doesn't really appeal to me anymore, it's definitely just a preference of mine. Whilst I did finish this I'm going to learn from my experiences with The Name of the Wind and just accept that sequels are definitely not for me. Next we have Far From The Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy and I've got my mum's ancient copy here, which is older than her because it is from the 50s, 1957. It looks like it was published and yes, it's looking a little bit worse for wear, um, but I actually listened to this book and I started off really enjoying um, Hardy's kind of romp through fictional Wessex. Um, I read Judy the Obscure, I read Tess of the D'Urbervilles um, quite a long while ago now and I kind of appreciated Hardy's lighter side in this book and he's describing the lives of Gabriel Oak and Bathsheba Everdeen um, living in rural England and I thought this novel started off really strong. I loved the description of Oak um, I loved the description of the surrounding countryside and farming life in the Victorian era. Um, I mean, granted, it was it's probably a little bit patronising um, in its descriptions of, of rural life, but it's kind of to be expected. <laughs> I just don't think that predominantly romantic storylines are for me. It's rare that I love a book which has, like, main the main storyline is, is a romance one. Um, because the main thrust of this novel is Bathsheba Everdeen and her various suitors, Gabriel Oak um, being one of them, and they kind of all end up fighting to be her chosen one. Um, and once the focus shifted to that a few chapters in, I was just no longer interested, particularly because Bathsheba is so annoying. <laughs> I actually think, even though I was enjoying the lightness of this book, I think I probably can safely say that I prefer Hardy's sort of darker, later novels. Okay, final book. The only problem with doing these videos in kind of priority of, of what I want to talk to you guys about the most, we're just kind of trying to balance the order in which I go, basically. Um, the only problem with that is that we always kind of end on a negative, unless I have an amazing month where I read only incredible books. But anyway, this 
one I didn't love. This is Claude Mackay's Home to Harlem. And I think the read I don't exactly know how this ended up on my shelf, but I have read Claude Mackay's poetry before. He was a big figure in the Harlem Renaissance scene. He was writing poetry. He's more well known for his poetry than his novels, of which this is the first novel. But um, yes, I like his poetry. I think that's how this ended up on my shelf. I'm not sure. Um, but when I read the intro to this book, I was quite interested because there's quite a lot of parallels with Richard Wright's Native Son. So this was written, I think something like 12, published 12 years before um, Native Son. thought maybe they would make interesting novels to speak to each other. Um, but yes, so although he was best known for his poetry, Home to Harlem was, at the time, um, like Wright's novel, quite the bestseller. Um, and it was also, on the other hand, criticised by African-American writers for playing into stereotypes, much like Native Son was. However, sadly, unlike Native Son, I did not get on with it at all, and I think Native Son is far superior. Um, so this novel kind of just seemed like an aimless journey through Harlem with some unsavoury characters which have pretty much nothing to like about them. It has none of Wright's narrative tension, none of the psychological inquiry, none of the nuanced kind of portrait of the workings of race and class. This may be a little bit of an odd comparison to make, particularly because this other novel is much later, but it reminded me of On the Road, which as we know I hated, um, because it just seemed to me moving like endlessly forward with no real thought, point, introspection, time to pause, nothing. It just like was like, and on to the next thing, and the next thing. It's just not for me, that style of novel is not for me. Um, so yes, did not love this one, but I think you should probably skip it. I would recommend looking up Mackay's poetry. So that is everything you guys. I hope that you enjoyed this month's video. Um, I feel like I had a lot of thoughts this month about these books. Everything, quite a lot of my feelings were mixed um, about lots of these books, which was a bit sad. I hope it was useful though for you guys and um, I hope I'll be back next month with lots more good books to talk about. But yes, thank you guys for watching and I will see you again very soon. Bye!